Now, the sampler that um, Paul C. was known for using, large professor known for using, but the EMU SP-12 and SP-1200, these are like, these are like the instruments and the sound of early 90s hip-hop, late 80s, early 90s. That This was it, right? Like, people moved on mostly past drum machines, and this is what they were using. Everybody was using these. Um, Dr. Dre used them in, the, in, in you make an NWA. You know, everybody used this shit, you know what I'm saying? Um, so basically, anything made from 88 to 94 for the most part, was made on the SP-12 or SP-1200. More on the SP-1200, which is just a later iteration of it. Now, and throughout that, so that's why when you listen to a lot of like stuff from that era, it was like really, it was really dark and moody. The drums were really like crunchy, um, you know. But um, now the thing about the SP-12 was its limitations. Um, it had 10 seconds of sampling time. That's not a lot that you can load onto the, um, onto, I believe it has uh, eight pads, onto the eight pads. That's 10 seconds is not a lot of time, you know, not a lot of stuff you can, you can lace onto your, your sampler. So um, that forced people to get real, real, real creative. So one thing that people would do is they would sample a loop you know, that would typically be a five second loop, drum loop. And they would sample it at 45 RPM, which would make it play really fast. And so it only take up two seconds of sampling time. Once they got it into the SB12, they detune it five semitones. Five semitones will get you from uh, 45 RPM to 33 RPM, which is how the drum the drum sample originally sounded, right? Like you play back a record on 33, what you do is you speed it up to 45 so it goes really fast and it takes up less time and then what you do in the sampler is you take this three second sample or two second sample that should be a five second drum loop, right? And you tune that down, you slow it down five semitones which, which gets you from 45 RPM sounding to 33 RPM sounding, okay? Now the thing with this tool is it had a, a really, really slow uh, sampling rate. Um, sampling rate was 26.04 kilohertz per second. Now, that's half the fidelity of a, of a CD, roughly. A CD is around 48 kilohertz. Now, you say, why would you want something to sound crappier? It made a dope sound. Now, when you talk about uh, sampling rate, you're basically talking about how many times per second something records information about frequency. And frequency is low, mids, and high. So bass and treble and mid-range, essentially. How much information it captures about, uh, about that. You know, um, so the higher the sampling rate, the more information it, it captures. And part of the, what I just said is like a record has infinitely more you know, a higher sampling rate to it because it's more authentic to the human voice. So why would you want to take a, something that reduces that to crap? It's just how it made it sound. It made it sound dope, you know. Um, it, it, had, it was 12-bit uh, sa uh, sampling resolution as well, or what's called bit depth. So this is how many times per second when it, when it captures a waveform like this. If you think of an audio waveform um, that goes up and, and down, right? It's uh, like how many times on that up and down are there, are, are there, is there information captured about volume, about levels that we hear? And it would capture, you know, it was 12 bits. So it was a really low bit, bit rate. You know, most stuff you hear is 24, 24 bits or it could, you know, what, or whatever. And so, you know, um, it, and it created this crazy, crazy gritty drum sound you know and it was like one of the reasons why you know anything sampled on sp12 specifically drums had a crazy grit or warmth to them a super punch you know crunch you know um, it made bass lines sound really dark um, and samples were really choppy because of the limitations of the machine now you're saying like oh man this must have sounded like like shit you know um 
it didn't. It sounded fantastic. It sounded kind of kind of amazing, and it defined helped to define the sound of that of that era, which is like, you know, a really important era um, in, in hip hop music. Now, what this forced was this: you know, you had all these technical limits, and it actually forced producers to get more creative. Now. You know, uh, people started sampling in mono because, you know, drums are going to typically play, play back in, in mono. So um, when you record with, um, with your drums in stereo, it's just going to replicate the, the same information and take up more, more disk space. So people would sample in mono or they would sample the drums in stereo and, and convert them to mono so they basically took up less time and data and information because again like you tens 10.7 seconds of sampling time um you know, people just got real creative so the, so the, here's a quote from ski uh ski produced jay-z's first album um um, Ski Beats you can look them up on Instagram and stuff but Ski produced Jay-Z's first album Reasonable Doubt and this is what he said, the limited sampling time made you become more creative. That's how a lot of producers learned how to chop samples. We didn't have no time, so we had to figure out ways to stretch the sounds and make it all mesh together. We basically made musical collages, just chopping up little bits and notes. So that was the thing. People started chopping, you know, chopping stuff up and manipulating stuff and sampling at 45 or 33, I mean at 45 or higher speeds and all that stuff and then chopping it up and all that stuff um, because like they were limited by how much they could do. Now, I mean, now you could fit, you know, days worth of sound into a computer and you have infinite, you know, infinite stuff, you know, even like my hardware based stuff, you know, you can, you can load tons of stuff into, into the memory of the machine. You just couldn't put that much. These fools were sampling on little floppy disks, you know, um, which dude had like no memory space on them uh, so you could basically make a song on a disc so they were relying on discs and these were like you know not reliable uh forms of storing media you know this is before like big hard drives and and all that stuff way before like 15 20 years before okay and uh yeah, I like this. I like this. This is from Hank Shockley of the Bomb Squad from Public Enemy. Um, and this, this again, goes back to, like, you having to push the instrument, the instrument's limitations forcing you to push how to use it creativity, creatively. Hank Shockley said this, I was playing Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos, and it came out real muffled. Okay, I couldn't hear any of the high-end part, meaning the treble or mid-range. I found out that if you put the phono or quarter-inch jack halfway in, it filters the high frequency. Um, now I just got the bass part of the sample. I was like, oh shit, this is the craziest thing on the planet. This is mad important. Basically, in the back of the, um, of the, uh, of the SB-12, um, where you put in a, a jack cable, a cable, from your mixer, or your, you know, your turntable or whatever, if that jack wasn't all the way in on the SB-12, it would actually act as a low-pass filter, meaning it would only let the bass come through. So all these cats who would filter their bass lines on the SP-12, when they would sample, they would pull out the jack halfway because it would only bring in the low end part of the sample. Now you just apply a low pass filter and you adjust the parameters so it just filters out or lets the low end pass through. But again, this is just speaking to like how, how these, these, these cats use, use this, this tool as a musical instrument, right? They pushed what it was supposed to do and they got real creative with it, you know, and, and, it, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it's impressive, you know. 